and welcome back to the 12th season of The Great Historical Debate. If you've been tracking with us from the beginning, or for you been watching on Netflix, we've been working our way all the way up to the 18th century and the Age of Enlightenment. On the last episode, we covered the three eras of philosophical thought. On today's episode, we have a panel of Enlightenment thinkers from the 1700s. Thank you all for being here with us today. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. First of all, before we get into a lot of depth about the Enlightenment and what it means and its impact, it'd be nice if we could get a little more background on how the Enlightenment came to be. On the last episode, we mentioned the Scientific Revolution and the drastic impact it had on the thinking of the time. But could you briefly address the impact in your thoughts? Yes, of course. The Revolution helped give birth to the Enlightenment. The driving idea of Enlightenment was to take principles used to solve scientific problems and use these to then solve the social and political problems around us. We had transitioned from our earliest era of philosophical thought, the classical age filled with ancient and medieval philosophies to the modern age. In the classical age, God was authority. God and the world were interacting and both reached to one another and cared about one another's doings. But now in the modern era, with the concept of enlightenment in full effect, society saw many changes. There was the new belief that once God built it all, he then walked away. God was now viewed as transcendent and the world now as a machine. We now only reached up to God for reason. We now looked and relied less on God and more on the scientific reasoning for answers. The Enlightenment, therefore, had a lot of impact. The scientific revolution transformed people's views of the world, approach of knowledge, and understanding of traditional Christianity. You mentioned that the scientific problem shaped your thinking. Could someone please go over the characteristics of the Enlightenment? The four characteristics of the Enlightenment are reason, which means the world is noble through experience and thought, empirical method of science, which is the best way of knowing, the questioning of tradition, and the emphasis on individualism. You just mentioned that individualism is a key characteristic of the Enlightenment, but we also know that the Enlightenment had a drastic impact on the worldview. Could you address how the Enlightenment impacts worldview? How Enlightenment impacts worldviews can fall under three categories. Progressive thinking, in naturalism, and the state of nature. Progressive way of thinking is that in which human can, uh, humankind increasingly is getting better, yet naturalism believes that everything has arose from nature. The state of nature is a belief that society can coexist harmoniously without any superstitions. An example of this is a Tahitian society we found where everyone can be happy without Christianity. Here we have a question from a viewer at 123 Classical Thinker claims that the Enlightenment leads to a negative agenda of rejecting tradition and being anti-Christian. What would you say to defend yourself and advocate for a positive agenda? Yes, people may say that we are rejecting tradition because we feel that old wisdom is no longer wisdom. In doing that, people think we are becoming anti-Christian because we believe humanity must save and rely on itself. However, we have the idea to create social improvements. We want to get rid of corruption in religion and class distinction and intolerance. We want to do away with witch hunts and superstition. Not only are we helping with social improvements of the society, but we are wanting to help with education. By providing education to more people, this will make our society more informed and prepared and realizing that traditions are not as important as we once thought they were. John, you've been kind of quiet this whole time, which is uncharacteristic of you. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself, your religious experience, and your Enlightenment views? So I was a leading figure in the Evangelical Awakening of the 18th century. I preached everywhere from churches to fields to houses and organized small groups called Methodist gatherings. Uh, my four main sources of authority for Christianity were scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. Thank you all for coming out today. See you next time. Thank you all for joining us today. On this episode of The Great Historical Debate, we are covering the real pirates of the Caribbean. Today we are joined by the Spanish, the British, the Portuguese, a Dutch person, and a buccaneer pirate. Thank you all for joining us today. Mr. Pirate, for starters, could you please tell us and the audience what the Golden Age of Piracy is? The Golden Age of Piracy started soon after the discovery of the New World and took place from the 1660s to the 1730s. It marked a large-scale act of robbery and criminal violence at sea, and it covered three separate outbursts of piracy, the buccaneering period, the pirate round, and lastly, the post-Spanish succession period. Mr. Portuguese, now that we know the golden age of piracy, can you please tell us specifically what happened in the years of 1494 and 1529? 1494 was the Treaty of Tordesillas. This treaty divided the new land into Spanish and ours. We could conquer all land that wasn't already led by a Christian leader. This treaty didn't set easily, though. It set into motion the rise of piracy. Even though the meridian was set, it, was set, it wasn't strictly followed, and it led to disputes over the Spice Islands. In 1529, the Meridian was re-established in the Treaty of Zaragoza. 
Miss Spain, these treaties that the Portuguese just mentioned gave you the exclusive right to trade and to the wealth of the Americas. Could you go over the wealth of the Americas and what it was and what you are trading and the impact of that? Yes, that Treaty of Tordesillas greatly expanded our trade to the Americas. Without this treaty, the wealth we gained from the Americas in terms of silver, gold, fur, and slaves made our country extremely prosperous. This expansion of our trade to the Americas resulted in a global trade network primarily between Europe, the Americas, and Asia. Our expansion of trade to the Americas allowed different societies from all across the globe to experience the effect of our expanding wealth. Without this treaty and our expansion to the Americas, the globe would have been far less integrated and the silver trade would have never been kickstarted as fast as it did due to our involvement. Now, Miss Buccaneer, we know that the Spanish were gaining power. They were taking and increasing the control of their islands along the way. Could you address how this impacted your rise? The Spanish ended up releasing livestock onto some of these islands for future provisions where we began to smoke the meat. We weren't content to make and sell jerky though, therefore we started to harass the Spanish and participate in the trade. The Spanish responded by killing off all of the livestock and going after our men. The food supply now cut completely, we turned to piracy to meet our needs. This leads to a big conflict and the Caribbean ultimately becomes a battleground for the world's superpowers, Spain, England, France, and Holland. Madam Queen of England, could you now elaborate on how the Buccaneers became privateers for your country? <coughs> Pirates. First and foremost, it should be noted that the British are firmly against all piracy and that we are doing our best to end the gross crimes that have been committed against pirate that the pirates have been committed. However, between you and me, if we had hired privateers as you're suggesting, which I'm not saying we did, then we could probably have done so by taking the buccaneers, which were already wreaking havoc on the cities, to participate in trade or more or less challenge the Spanish. So it sounds like the Caribbean is becoming a battleground for the world superpowers, Spain, England, France, and Holland. Could you please, Miss Vanderwoodson, talk about how this battle is significant to you? The Queen Anne War, also known as the War of Spanish Succession, lasted from 1702 to 1713. It consisted of England and Holland fighting against Spain and France and ended with the English and the Dutch being treated as equal trading partners. Now that the privateers are out of a job, what were the trends that most privateers followed once unemployed? This was dangerous. These jobless men who had once been trained to attack ships and seize goods as privateers were now looking for work. This resulted in an immense temptation to turn pirate during these times. Many men ended up doing so. Raiding and plundering with impunity and complete disregard for all authority, the pirates were as ruthless as they were successful. Great Britain, you look a little frustrated over there. What did you guys do following this massive trend of piracy? Well, as you mentioned, the privateers turned to piracy after they lost their jobs. This piracy really got a twist in our knickers, so we decided to hire someone to kill the pirates. However, there were so many pirates, and to kill them would have really been a pain. So in January 1718, I decided to allow for King's pardon wherein the pirates could come, turn themselves in, and be pardoned for their crimes. This turned out to be very effective, and in 1770s, piracy became very rare, especially with the creation of the Piracy Act in 1698, which was an act for the, most, for the more effective suppression of piracy. Thank you, sir. And as you mentioned before, piracy is very rare. But as we know today, piracy is far from over. Despite being a crime of u universal jurisdiction because of the hindrance on foreign trade, granted, it is not all at the level it was before. This now concludes the episode of Real Pirates of the Caribbean. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome back. Today we'll be talking about the economic transformations of the early modern world. Joining us on the show, we have representatives from Britain, Portuguese, Spain, Spain and Asia, as well as an African slave. Thank you all for being here today. Now, to the Portuguese. Could you tell us what drove European involvement in the world of Asian commerce and to what extent did the Portuguese did you guys end up realizing your goals in the Indian Ocean? So our most immediate motivation was the desire for tropical spices. However, another major motivation came from the consequences of the Black Death. The population was finally on its way back up and European cities were becoming centers for international commerce. We wanted to recover the European civilization and we could not allow for the source of supply for these desired goods to be focused in Muslim hands. Also, we wanted to circumvent the monopolies of the time given that our supplies were not as attractive. In terms of achieving our goals, we soon realized that no one in the Indian Ocean had any firepower on their boats and with the Chinese gone, we were able to force our way into Indian Ocean, taking control of various bases <clears throat> on our way. Thus, we created a trading post empire that where we controlled the commerce by force of arms.
However, we failed to control the Indian Ocean commerce as we had hoped, and by the 1600s, our trading post empire was on sharp decline. To the British representative, the Portuguese just mentioned her initiatives and the, and the goals in the Indian Ocean. Could you go over your initiatives as well as those of everyone else's and how they're really different? Portugal and Spain were both very involved in the spice trade. Where Portugal introduced a trading post empire, Spain had more of a colonial rule over the islands. Later on, the Dutch were the big successors of Portugal, taking over the spice trade and introducing a private trading company. The British also did private trading companies, but they were more based in India and they focused on cotton textiles as they couldn't overcome the Dutch in the spice trade. To our Asian representative, so what, to what extent did these British and Dutch trading companies affect your societies in Asia? The English knew they were no match for the powerful Mughal Empire which ruled India. So instead they secured trading bases with permission of Mughal authority with substantial payments and bribes as the price of admission into the Indian market. They became heavily involved in trade with Asia and the profits from this enabled the English to purchase Asian goods without paying for them in gold and silver. Overall, to the great powers of Asia, Europeans represented no real military threat and played minor roles in their large and prosperous economy. To our Spanish representative, what was the historical importance of the silver trade? The entirety of trade at the time was based upon the silver trade. We discovered enormously rich silver deposits in the city of Potosi, which was then shipped across the globe and ended back in our hands. Boasting the most silver, we were able to pursue military and political ambitions in Europe and in Americas that our neighbors simply couldn't. With this vast wealth that we created, we set about a complicated global trading network in which the silver we mined was used to buy the sought-after Asian products and textiles, which in turn the Chinese used to pay their taxes in exchange with other lesser European nations. This circulation of wealth was all caused by yours truly. Unfortunately, this infusion of silver into our economy didn't create the outcome we hoped for, as our strict regulated economy with our many monopolies prevented us from reaping the real benefits of our wealth. Elsewhere, silver caused many European nations to be caught up, with, caught up in an economical crisis of some sort, as it actually caused prices of goods to be driven higher, resulting in social upheaval. Mm -hmm. In the early modern era, furs joined silver textiles and spices as some of the major items in the global commerce. Could you, Mr. Huron, tribe leader, describe the impact of the fur trade on North American natives? societies as well as the similarities and differences that they bear on the Siberian. For those of us natives who hunted, trapped, and processed and transported these products, the fur trade bore various benefits in the beginning. Initially, we were able to negotiate prices and, the ro and our role in the trade protected us from extermination, but nothing could really protect us from the disease. Furthermore, the fur trade generated a lot of war among tribes and this combined with the disease decimated our populations. We soon became dependent on the European product, especially alcohol. It sounds like the Siberians had a similar experience to ours in regard to disease and dependence on Russian goods in their case. We also both had settlers encroaching on our land and many of the species which generated our fur quickly decimated. However, Russian fur trade differed from ours in that theirs was, there was no competition among traders in Siberia, and Russian authorities were able to impose taxes on every man which was payable in fur, and there was a, a large-scale presence of pirate, private Russian hunters and trappers who competed directly with Siberian counterparts. Could you, Mr. African Slave Representative, explain the rise of the Atlantic slave trade and describe what is distinctive about the Atlantic slave trade? The introduction of sugar encouraged many Europeans to establish sugar plantations in the Mediterranean and the West Coast African islands. The dangerous work of sugar plantations was way too much for wage labor, which led to the use of slavery. Countries like Portugal and Spain traveled to Africa in search of gold and to subjugate Saracens. Spain and Portugal realized that Africa was a new source to find slavery. The most distinctive feature about African slavery was its size. African slave trade is significantly larger than any other slavery, as Africa became a prime source of slave labor in the plantations of the Americas. To the British representative, we were just told what made the Atlantic slave trade distinctive, but could you elaborate on what roles the Europeans as well as the Africans played on the Atlantic slave Obviously, trade? European demand for slaves was the greatest cause of the Atlantic slave trade, but the British never had to raise arms or worry about exposure to tropical diseases because the Africans were perfectly willing to capture and sell one another to the Europeans peacefully. In what ways did the European slave trade impact or transform the African societies? Slave trade impacted our societies by spreading our people all over the world. This created new issues of racism. The slave trade had different effects 
all over Africa. It disrupted our countries by taking and misusing our people. It strengthened some societies, but mainly corrupted our societies. The elites enriched themselves while the slaves were victimized and tortured. Thank you all for coming out today. See you next time. So, welcome back to another episode of the Great Historic Debate Show. On today's show, we will be discussing the topic of religion and science from 1450 to 1750. Please help me welcome to the show a Jesuit priest, a Protestant, an Islamic Indian, a Chinese man, and an Enlightenment thinker. Thank you for being here today. Our first question today goes out to our Protestant. Could you tell us in what ways the Protestant Reformation transformed European society, culture, and politics? Well, the Protestant Reformation had great impact on the European society. As the Reformation began in 1517 with Martin Luther's publicly introduced document called the 95 Theses, it started a debate about church life and practice. Luther's beliefs were based solely on the Bible alone, not the teachings of the church. This set into motion a divide within the Catholic Christendom, which further divided po political, economic, and social groups. Religious differences were high. Now the Reform Reform Reformation shined light on skeptics towards authority and tradition. The Reformation has successfully challenged the power instilled in the Pope by the Church. Reformation brought a new individualistic way of thinking and interpreting the Bible, as well as in turn an independent intellectual based way of living. Now, we just elaborated on European imperialism. Could you, Mr. Priest, specify how European expansion related to the spread of Christianity and in what ways European Christianity assimilated into the Native American cultures of Spanish America? As our explorers began to venture to new places, we were constantly in search of Christians. And when we didn't find them, we sought to help bring people to the light. Where Protestants focused primarily internally, Catholics focused on converting externally. In Spanish America, Christianity was well, was well taken because they had a lot of European people and there was no previous literate form of religion. We found that trying to decimate pagan shrines developed a huge amount of resistance and in order to avoid this, we decided to try and integrate their beliefs into Christianity. And we found that this was much more effective. For example, we would build churches on, near, on or near sites of temples where they focused on communities or we would find saints that closely paralleled the functions of their previous gods. All of this allowed for a more smooth transition to the faith. And for our Chinese representative, we just addressed the spread of Christianity in Spanish America. Could you please explain why the spread of Christianity was so much less successful in China? China was never subject to the extent of European religious imperialism as the Americas were. Instead, due to our strict policy on the amount of European missionaries operating in our country at a time, the country never experienced a wave of Christian converts. Instead, Europeans had to be wary of our Chinese culture and the way they tried to promote their religious views. Instead of trying to denounce our customs, which would have resulted in dire consequences for the missionaries if I say so myself, they tried to point out the many parallels between Confucianism and Christianity. They sold these religious ideas primarily to the elites by promoting their mathematical, astronomical, technological, and map-making map skills that we were interested in. While Christianity permeated through a small amount of Chinese elites, they, these efforts only resulted in about 200,000 to 300,000 converts compared to our population that boasted almost 300 million. The reason for this general rejection of Christian missionaries was due to the fact that Chinese people did not need to have a spiritual awakening as Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, and a, mul and a multitude of Chinese gods and spirits already fulfilled this spiritual need. Our people soon learned that Christianity involved a strict adherence to their doctrine, which would require the people of China to give up their deeply rooted spiritual values. By the time the Pope declared Chinese spiritual traditions an act of adultery, our king rulers exiled most of the missionaries, but the Christian missionaries were not to be trusted. Their adherence to the Qing dynasty, who we are not too fond of, their, their self-proclamation as miracle workers, which we all know is fantastical, their practice of cannibalism and Holy Communion, and the fact that they were taken over many of our neighboring countries made them extremely untrustworthy. We were too smart to be outwitted by these Christian peerless. Miss Islamic representative, at the same time Christianity was spreading, Islam was also spreading. What accounts for the spread of Islam? in the early modern era and for the emergence of reform or renewal movements within the Islamic world. Wandering Sufis, Islamic scholars, and itinerant traders offered a wider connection to the Islamic world, even in the Americas. In Java, traditional animistic practices as well as Islamic practices coexisted peacefully. 
This syncretism was offensive to many Orthodox Muslims and led to renewal and reform in the religion. And what kind of cultural changes occurred in China and India during the early modern era? Neither China nor India's cultural or religious changes were as dramatic as Europe's, however, neither were stagnant during the early modern era. In China, Buddhist and Taoist influences led to Neo-Confucianism. In some other elites placed an emphasis on research and facts, which class with Neo-Confucian ideas. In the lower classes, a popular culture of paintings, novels, and plays became more prominent. In India, it was more based on religion. New practices such as bhakti, which focused less on class distinction or detailed rituals and more on being one with God. Women were especially drawn to this practice. Another new practice was Sikhism, which was very similar to bhakti, but um, these believed that there was only God, no Hindus or Muslims. We know that as China and India were changing during the early modern era, so too was the early European world. Mr. Enlightened Thinker, why did the scientific revolution occur in Europe rather than China or the Islamic world and what made the scientific revolution revolutionary? Neither China or the Islamic world could catch up with Europe's technological advances. Although Europeans had a legal system that evolved over the years based on an idea of a corporation that people would work and be treated as a unit. This system guaranteed the measure of independence for in institutions like the church, the guilds, the towns and cities, professional associations, and the universities. The emerging universities opened up new doors for scholars to study freely without the pressure of st that was stemmed from the church and the state authorities. Universities started the scientific revolution with their diverse areas and possible studies, allowing people's thinking to change from theological to philosophical. This revolution was so effective because it had changed all the generations to come after the scientific revolution. People are more likely to think philosophically and then theologically in the future. We mentioned in the first episode that Enlightenment thinking significantly changed early patterns of European thinking, but how specifically did 19th century developments in the sciences challenge the faith of Enlightenment? Charles Darwin was a very big influence to many people, with his two ideas of competitive survival and that all life was a constant change. His two books of or The Origin of Species and The Descent of Man came as a large surprise to a completely upended traditional religious views that Copernicus had suggested earlier. The thinking of people had changed from traditional religious views to more scientific explanations of mankind. These views stemmed from the teachings, of I the teachings and ideas of Freud, Marx, and Darwin. Mr. Chinese Representative, in what ways were these European influences in science that we just heard about received by Asians in the early modern era? As a nation, we were very selective of the European sciences shown to us by the Jesuit missionaries. While we rejected most European medicinal breakthroughs, we did strike an interest in their techniques for predicting eclipses, reforming the calendar, making accurate maps of our empire, and mathematics. The influx of new European scientific breakthroughs came at a convenient time as the Kaozang movement that emphasized research based on evidence and looking into ancient Chinese in innovations was circulating in the nation at the time. We viewed many of their discoveries as ones that built off of our ch ancient Chinese ideas so that we could accept their input despite their barbarian nature. We didn't accept European scientists as fact, but instead selectively assimilated Western science. This interview lays the ground for the growing role of Europeans on the global stage, which drastically impacted the way that we view the world today. Thank you all for joining us today and please join us for our next episode of the Great Historical Debate where we will learn about the European moment in world history.